Good morning. How are you guys doing? Good. Uh, my name's Brandon Williams. Um, I'm from the Statesboro uh, Connection Church, and uh, I've been looking forward to coming and sharing with you um, for, for some time. And I want to really first let you know um, how cool it's been to watch what God's doing here. Um, you know, as a network of churches and just being in the area, we hear so many good things that are happening here about your willingness to serve, not just in the church, but in the community. The generosity of people here has been incredible. Um, the community of people that's built here is, is amazing. And, and just the heart to reach folks, all of those things are so um, incredible and so good to hear about. And I know sometimes when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to see, especially um, for Michael and Savannah, it's hard to see it sometimes. But I want you to know that we hear about it and God has, has done and is doing some incredible things. And so we're really excited about that. Um, today, as we just heard, I'm going to uh, talk to you um, out of Ephesians chapter four uh, in this uh, series called The Heart of the Church. I think I got that right. Um, and so I'm excited about this. I love this passage of scripture. It's one of my favorite passages in, in the whole Bible um, because in chapter three and four, it gives us such a clear per picture of our purpose um, and what God's called us to and even what God has equipped us to do. And so um, I would like to, to go there and, and what I'd like to do first is I really want to pray for us that God would open our eyes to see this more clearly, that if we have any incorrect ways of thinking, those things would be torn down. Um, and so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Let's lift up our hearts. Let's open our hearts even right now. Lord, we thank you for your word and its truth. I thank you, God, that the gospel is still powerful today. Thank you that the gospel still saves. Your word still opens eyes. Your spirit still opens eyes. Your spirit still, still takes people from death to life. That people still are coming to know you. People are still being set free from sin and death and hell and the grave. And I thank you for that. And this morning, I pray, Lord, that our eyes would be open more to see our part in this, to see this incredibly good news of the gospel, but also how we play a part in that, God. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the grace you've given, the power of your spirit, your ability in us to do for us, and in us and through us, what we can't do on our own, Lord. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, a lot of times I start out messages by asking you a question. And so, um, you know, we, we need to be pretty honest here and, and, and um, open and transparent. But how many of you have ever been lied to? Anybody ever been lied to? That's pretty easy to raise our hand for, right? Like, yeah, we've been lied to. I've been lied to. Man, I can think about the person that lied to me. But here, here's the next question. How many of you have ever lied, right? If you didn't raise your hand, then you're a liar, right? Because we've, we've all done it. And, and so um, I've had times where in my life where I've lied. I remember one specific time in the seventh grade. This has been a long time ago, obviously, but I still remember it like it was yesterday. I cheated on some math homework. Uh, I was at a buddy's house, went my best friend. Um, I cheated on and copied his homework, his math homework. Not good to copy math homework when you're multiplying like 1,020 by 2,010 or something like that because if you get the exact same wrong answer, it's pretty obvious what happened, right? And so I copied it down. He got a couple wrong. Um, how dare him? And the teacher sees this, calls us out into the hallway, and uh looks me in the eyes and she says, did you cheat? Being the honest person that I am, I looked her in the eyes and I said, no, ma'am. She then looks at my best friend and I'm like, hey, we're tight, right? We're tight. We got, we're, 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 we're in this together. We're going to go down together. She looks him in the eyes and she says, did you cheat? He looked her in the eyes and he said, yes, ma'am, I did. I'm like, what the heck, man? Like, you just sold me out, right? And so we've all lied. And, and here's the thing I want you to understand that in many ways, many ways, you have been lied to. 
in many ways you've been lied to and you've been lied to in ways that you don't even realize. And today I want us to see this. I want to read a little bit of chapter four um, here that as we go through it that that we haven't read yet. And, And this is in verse one. It says, as a prisoner for the Lord then, it's Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now, when we look at this, the first thing I want you to understand, and I want you to understand you've been lied to, is you've been lied to by the world. You've been lied to by culture. And in many ways, we don't recognize this. And the main way you've been lied to is you've been told over and over and over again by the world that it is about me, not we. It's about me, not we. And so we, we, we come to this conclusion that all of life is about me. It's not about we. And that's a lie. And see, what happens is as we're told lies, we develop ways of thinking. And those ways of thinking become our worldview. It becomes how we see everything, how we see God, ourselves, others, and our purpose. And so as the world is telling us in everything that it's about me, not we, what ends up happening is that becomes my way of thinking. That becomes the lens through which I see everything, how I see God, how I see myself, how I see others, and how I see my purpose. And this is how I begin to develop my thinking. Now think about how powerful this is. Because the way I think controls the decisions I make. The decisions I make controls the way I live. And so that's why Paul tells us that we need to have our minds renewed and that that is the way we are transformed. We are transformed through the renewing of our mind and it comes through the power of God's word pulling down strongholds or the lies that we have been told by the world. We've been told that it's, me, not we, when actually it is we, not me. And Paul says this here. He says, as a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. But when we read the Bible, so many times we bring that back home to me. When we read you, it means me. How many of you read that right there? You think when it says you live a life worthy of the calling, right? And we go, okay, I need to live a life worthy of the calling. And that is true. We are to be growing into Christ's likeness. God takes us from glory to glory in the image of Christ. That is true. But most of the time when you read in Scripture where it says you, it means we. It is a plural. And in this context, he is telling us you, us, Live a life that is worthy of the calling of Christ. Even when we look at um, the Sermon on the Mount and Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. He's not just saying, Brandon, you're the salt of the earth. He's saying, you, this community of people, you are the salt of the earth. When Paul is going through Ephesians 2 and he's talking about this great temple that's being built together, these stones that are being put together, he's talking about the whole body. He's talking about in Ephesians 2 and 3, this unique community of diverse people from all backgrounds and cultures and walks of life who come together living a life worthy of the calling of the Lord that displays to the angels and the demons and everything in the heavenly realms that this is the wisdom of God that what the enemy tried to destroy that God has put back together through the foolishness of the gospel of a man hung on a tree who wasn't an ordinary man but was Jesus Christ, the perfect man who took our sin, who died our death, who was buried in a tomb, but three days later came out, has now ascended to heaven, sent back his spirit, forgiven us of our sins, made us righteous in him, and brought us together by that same spirit. So that now you and I, we are this body, this new community of people that are so different. I mean, you just look around the room. We're so different. We come from different backgrounds, different walks of life. And yet the, he tells us right here that you are called to live a life worthy of the Lord. We are called to live a life worthy of the Lord. And we oftentimes in the church look at the, the, the failures of Christians. But I would say this, that the failure of 
Christianity has not just been in the individual's life, it's been in the community's life. Because we haven't given people an accurate understanding of who the church is, even by how we as Christians play together. We fight over petty things. We get disgruntled over stupid things. We we just don't give a very good picture. And when we look at Scripture, when we think because you've been lied to by the world that it's about me, and when we even look at Scripture, we see it through a lens of me. And when we look at Scripture and we look at God's purpose for our lives, we have to understand that it is we, not me. It is we, not me. Your purpose is so much greater than you. It's so much greater than me. It's so much greater than the individual because you as the individual and me as an individual cannot accomplish our purpose apart from each other. Completely impossible for us to do this. We are the body of Christ. Paul talks about this a lot, that we are the body of Christ. Think about that, that you and I now together, this new unique community of people, you and I now together are Jesus's physical representation on earth. The body of Christ, the church is Jesus's physical representation on earth. And that means us together, not one person is just the representation of Jesus, but us together give the the clear picture of Jesus on earth. But because we think it's me, not we, we often don't live that way. Think about this. If you're walking down the sidewalk and you see a finger, like you don't pick that up and go, this is, this has got so much potential. Isn't this glorious? This, this, this thing right here could do a lot. No, you know what you do? You think what you're thinking right now. Like, that's gross, right? That's exactly where your mind goes. That is gross. Unfortunately, the way the church has existed in a lot of ways has just been gross. It hasn't been glorious. We've got to come to this realization that it's about we, not me. It's us, right? It's Me, it's we, not me. Your purpose in this life, he goes on and talks about like being humble, being gentle, being patient. Goes against everything that the world tells us, right? Don't be humble, be about you. It's about me. Don't be patient, get it now. But your purpose is so much more than what you can accumulate. So much more than getting as much as you can in this life is bigger than that. And if we're going to capture that, it has to be through we, not me. We've got to see through a different lens that our purpose is connected to each other. The second thing I want you to see is that you've lied to yourself. In many ways, you've lied to yourself. Every now and then, I think I get an amen from the other room. I don't know. I don't know if they can hear me, but a while ago I said something and I was like, hey man, I was like, was that in here? No, that was over there. So who knows how the word goes forth, right? And so the second thing I want you to see though is, is in many ways we've lied to ourselves. You've lied to yourself. And this happens because we live in a very performance-based world. The, the world system around us is all about performing. It's all about how well we do. So we come to this conclusion that we are the sum total of our successes and failures. That's how we see ourselves. We think that we are the sum total of our successes and failures. And we look at how well we can perform in different areas of our life. And we conclude that this is my capability. And we often bring that into the church and into our relationship with God And we define ourselves, we see ourselves, we limit ourselves many times because of the way we see ourselves to what we think we can do. And it's even oftentimes determined by the successes and failures we've had in life. But I want you to look at verse 7 with me. It says this, But to each one of us, 
grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. So you've been lied to that it's about your performance. You've been lied to that it's about your successes and failures, that it's about how well you can do. And so you look at things that go on in the church. You even think about trying to lead someone else to Christ. And then you go, I don't, I don't know if I can do that. You hear people talk about small groups and leaders. And so you go, I don't know. I don't think I can do that. You think about getting up in front of somebody and speaking or talking. You go, I don't know if I can do that. You even think about being able to read and understand the Bible. And you go, I don't know if I can do that. And I would ask you this, who told you that? Who told you that? Who lied to you? Who told you that you can't impact the kingdom of God? See, we live in this world, and and, and it's not hard to see this, that the ones who perform are the ones who are most rewarded, right? Why do they pay Mike Trout $400 million a year? Why do they pay Patrick Mahomes $500 million a year? Why do they pay pay LeBron, was it, $300 and something million a year? Um, Why do they pay these athletes millions and millions of dollars a year? Because they perform. They don't do it because they like them. They pay them all that money because they make them money. They perform so they get paid. And we bring that into the church. We bring that into our own understanding of ourselves. And we say, look, if I perform, then, man, I'll get paid. If I perform, then, man, I'm good. If I perform, then, man, um, it, but then we begin to do it in our own ability. And yet this is what it says in verse 7. It says, but to each one of us, grace has been given. Now, here's a mistake we often make is that we think about grace and we limit grace to just God's unconditional love and his unmerited favor. We limit grace in that. But I would challenge you, go through the New Testament and read every passage that says grace. And here's the thing you're going to find is grace is even personified. Grace teaches us. Grace empowers us. Grace saves us. Grace is personified. It's like you can't separate the Spirit from grace. It's why the Bible calls the Spirit, they call it calls Him the Spirit of grace. Because God's grace is not just unconditional love and unmerited favor. Listen, it is His ability in us to do for us, in us, and through us what we cannot do on our for ourselves. Now, if it was up to you and your ability, then you might be limited. But what Ephesians 4, 7 is telling us is that it's not up to my ability because God's ability has been placed in me. God's ability has saved me. God's ability will sanctify me. God's ability will equip me. God's ability will make me competent. But we've got to start looking through a different lens than the lens that we have developed that says it's up to my ability to perform. That is not the truth. It is God's ability in you, doing for you, in you, and through you what you cannot do for yourself. Now, many times we lean into our own ability. I would say always lean into grace. Don't forget that's how you were saved. It wasn't according to your ability, according to God's ability. And that's how God's going to make you into the image of Christ, not according to your ability, but according to God's ability. In fact, I want you to understand this, that the way God is going to use you is not according to your ability, but according to his ability. If it were up to his, my ability, I'd have no hope. I'd have no hope. But it's not. It's God's ability doing for me, in me, and through me what I cannot do for myself. You need to think about it like this. It's about God's amazing grace, not giving greater effort. God's amazing grace, not greater effort. I'm not saying you just sit on the couch and eat Cheetos and wait on God to do it to you, right? But what I am saying is if you trust in your ability, 
You cannot do anything of eternal value through your ability. But if you lean into God and trust in God's ability, you can be an eternal difference maker. We've got to realize this, that all of life after salvation, after faith in Christ, it's about God's ability, not ours. Listen, my ability was only good enough to earn me death, but his ability brought me to life. And now my ability has been crucified on the cross with Jesus so that his life and his ability can live in me. Listen. If, it, if, if there is a way for me to do it myself, then grace is no longer amazing. Why, why would something, why would grace, his ability in me, doing for me, in me and through me, what I cannot do for myself, be amazing if I really don't need it? But this realization that without grace, I am lost. I can do nothing. And I realize who I am apart from Christ, but who he's made me to become. And grace, once again, becomes so amazing. Here's, here's a trap we fall into. In this performance system, and this is one reason I think we're really distracted in the church from God's purpose. In this performance system that we live in, we will gravitate towards the things in which we find acceptance. Every human being has a desire for acceptance. And this performance system is so drilled into us that when we can find a place that we feel accepted, I perform well enough at blank that I am accepted, that will ultimately, if we are not careful, become the thing we worship. We will set that thing up in our life as an idol. It's why we give so much time often to work. Because look, I'm good at my job and I'm accepted. If I'm not respected at home, I can go to work and I become respected because I'm good at my job. Or if I'm respected at home and I'm not good at my job, I can make an idol of something really good, which is my family. If there's nowhere else that I'm, then man, look, I'm just going to pour every single ounce of everything I got into my family and my children are going to become my idol. Their athletics will become my idol. Their education will become my idol because look, this is where I can find acceptance. I can even create in my children an idol where I lift them up and say, look at my kids. They're better than yours, right? And I know this firsthand. When we moved to Statesboro, Georgia, it was way back in 1985. I know a lot of you weren't even born then. But in 1985, I was 10 years old. We moved to Statesboro, and I had no friends. Like for six months, eight months, had no friends, no friends. I could not make a friend. Everybody looked at me like um, I had four heads. You know what I mean? And, and so no friends at all. And then when it rolled around to springtime and it was time to play baseball, we went out for baseball. I was decent at baseball. I was pretty good at baseball. And you know what happened? Kids started coming around. And I started making friends. It was through baseball. And all of a sudden, I had this good friend and this friend and this friend and this friend. And you know what? That told me that baseball was a way for me to find acceptance. Baseball was where I could be accepted. And it didn't matter what was going on in the world when I stepped on a baseball field. Everything was okay because I was accepted. I was even looked up to, even had a reputation, even was talked about. And I set this thing up as where I would spend so much effort, so much time, so much focus. And I, I made this about my ability. It's easy to do that with ministry. We first started out in the church, boy. And everything rode on how good's the church doing? How good did I preach? That kind of thinking will destroy you because everything is built off of your ability. Your acceptance is determined by this thing that I now worship. 
and how well I've performed in it. And here's the thing we have to understand. We are accepted in Christ, not because of our ability, but because of grace. And here's the great thing this does for you as you live out your life in Christ. It gives you greater courage to try and take steps of faith because failure doesn't determine your acceptance. So what if I share my faith and somebody rejects it? Doesn't change who I am in Christ. So what if I preach a message and you might be going, you're preaching one now, that's not good, right? You know what that does? Do better next time. And these are two questions I ask myself. Did I say what God told me to say? And did I do my best? And if I can say yes to those, then you know what? I've done what I'm supposed to do. And I would tell you this, every day of your life, if you'll lean into grace and not your ability and ask yourself those two questions, did I do what God told me to do and did I do my best, then put your head on the pillow and go to sleep. You've done what you were expected to do. If we can live in that place, it brings so much freedom. But we need to understand in the church that it's about God's amazing grace not greater effort. The message we hear oftentimes is not the gospel. It's make yourself better. Fix yourself. And if you could have fixed yourself, you would have fixed yourself a long time ago. It's about God's ability, not our ability. Last thing. Last lie I want you to see. And this one, this one is, is a little chapter. They are getting with it now. So here's the thing that we look at in this. I want to read again, verse 11 through 13. He says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. The third place, the third way that we have been lied to is we have been lied to by the church. I'm not talking about this church. I'm not talking about Michael. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the religious system that exists, especially in the United States. We've been lied to in the church. And when we look at these passages specifically, I want you to see this, that you've been lied to because you've been told and you've witnessed and you've seen The church operate in a way that is very much about us and them. Us being the congregation, them being the paid profession, right? And so we oftentimes look at church and we go, well, it's us and them. It's them who stand up here or work and lead kids or lead other ministry areas. And then it's them. It's us and them. And that's not the way it is. It's us, not them. It's us together. You're called to be a part of ministry as much as Michael is. God desires to use you as much as he uses me or any other pastor that stands up here on Sunday. God desires for you to be a part of the body. And you've learned this through a religious system that's taught you that your purpose in the church is to show up on Sunday. Show up at Connect Group. Read your Bible a little bit. Give a little bit of money. You know? Support what the church is doing. And that's what you've been told and that's what you've seen. And that's where you've limited your role in the kingdom. And I like to call this system BS. A broken system, right? A broken system. Because that's what it is. It was never intended to be us and them. It's just us. It's just us. You, according to verse 7, have been apportioned grace by Jesus. And I would ask you this. It tells us that Jesus, he he descended to the earth. He died on a cross, he took our sin, he, he took back the keys to life and death, 
And he ascended to heaven, sent back the Spirit. He's apportioned grace to us. Are we really going to waste what Jesus died to give us? Because that's what's happening because of this lie that we believe. And it's heartbreaking for me to stand up Sunday after Sunday and look at people and look them in the face and know they have so many gifts that God has given them and they're being wasted. You see people who are successful teachers, contractors, carpenters, you know, um, bankers, whatever it might be. You see people who are successful in all these other things, and yet we find this one niche, as I was saying, that I can be successful at. And we never realize that the greatest success we're called to have is in the kingdom. So we work and work and work, and yet we throw away what Jesus died to give us, what he rose to give us, what he ascended to give us. And every single person in here, you have gifts inside of you, grace inside of you, his ability inside of you to do kingdom work. But we've been told in the religious system we exist in that the whole goal for us is get to heaven, right? Isn't that kind of what American Christianity's boiled the gospel down to? Get to heaven. Just get to heaven. And so I need to do enough good things. I need to show up enough on Sunday. I need to, I need to show up and, and connect groups some. I need to read my Bible some. I need to drop some money in the plate. I need to do whatever I do um, just to be good enough to get to heaven because ultimately that's what it's all about. And I would tell you this, that if that's all it's about, you're missing the best part, which is a relationship with God right now. We could boil down the American gospel um, into, how many of y'all listen to country music? Anybody listen to country music? Sinners, I'm kidding. But it's kind of like a country music gospel, right? And there's three songs I can tell you that will sum up the American gospel. The first one, Luke Bryan, I believe most people are good. Most people aren't good, <laughs> right? Most people aren't good. The only reason we see ourselves as good is because we compare ourselves to somebody worse than us, not to God. So we can always find somebody worse, right? And be like, whew, thank God I'm not like them. I'm not that bad. And so I, I believe most people are good. Well, you're an idiot, right? You're a millionaire, but you're an idiot. You're theologically incorrect, Luke Bryan, because I know that's what you're worried about. Most people aren't good. All people are sinners. Second song, Alan Jackson, Where I Come From. I know the song about the line in there, working hard to get to heaven, right? So I'm pretty good, and I'm just working hard to get to heaven. Last song, this one you got to go way back to, Joe Diffie. Prop me up beside the jukebox. Anybody know the line in that song? Lord, I want to go to heaven, but I don't want to go tonight, right? And so if I'm not that bad, I'm just going to work kind of hard and do the right things. And then the, maybe I'll go to heaven, but man, I don't want to go right now because I got some fun stuff I want to do, right? And, and so we, we look at it that way, and I'm telling you guys, we're missing it. We're missing it. We're missing the entire point. You have already entered into eternal life if you're in Christ. Jesus says this, to know the Father is eternal life. If you are in Christ and you have seen Christ, you have seen the Father, you know the Father, you are already in eternal life. You already have this connection with God. Yet we kind of go through this thing of trying to work a little harder, work a little harder, and we've lost sight of the why. Why would I want it to be about we, not me? Why do I want it to just be about amazing grace and not greater effort? Why do I, how can I stop working towards this? And, and when we lose sight of the why that is why, what Jesus did for us, what Jesus has done for us, if we lose sight of the love of God, then it's like drinking flat Coke. That's what Christianity becomes. How many, you turn it up your nose. How many of you ever got Coke and you like drank it and it was flat? 
You, you probably didn't drink any more of it, right? It's nasty. It's just blah. And, and, and Christianity becomes like that. If I'm just trying to apply greater effort, if, if I'm just trying to go through the works of all of it, and I'm just trying to get me to heaven, then let's, let's just be honest. Christianity kind of sucks, right? If there is no relationship with God, if there's no affection for God, if there's no working of the Spirit, if I'm not a part of something bigger than myself, if I'm not enjoying the community of believers, then Christianity is not very good. If I've never tasted the goodness of God, then it does not make sense for me to lay down my life for God. But when I've tasted the goodness and my eyes have been opened and I've seen clearly and I've experienced amazing grace doing for me what I cannot do for myself doing in me, what I cannot do for myself doing through me, what I cannot do for myself, how can I not spend life praising him with his people? We've been lied to. Kind of just been told. Attend church, keep quiet and give a little bit so the professionals can do the ministry. And we believe this, that the pros do the ministry and y'all are amateurs. And and so just just watch us work, right? Just watch us work. And that's a lie. How many of you have heard of a man by the name of Bob Jones? Anybody heard of Bob Jones? The golfer? Any golfers in here? I used to golf and then I quit cussing, dipping, and gambling. And it wasn't fun anymore, so I quit playing golf. But Bob Jones was an amateur golfer way back in the earlier 1900s. Bob Jones won four U.S. Opens. And Bob Jones won three British Opens, not to mention... I think six more amateur, like majors. Here's this guy, he never turned pro, but he had an incredible influence on golf. He actually helped design the Masters course. He was a part of bringing that into existence. This amateur. Do you think Bob Jones ever thought, I'm not very good because I'm not pro? Never. But somehow we've gotten that correlation in the church. If I'm not paid by the church, I'm an amateur and I don't have a place in the kingdom. And that's part of the BS, right? The broken system. You have a part. And the Bible tells us that you're to be equipped for this part. I want to show you how the church operates. Got a slide right here. I want you to see. Um, that helps to illustrate this. And so I hope you can see this. I want you to look at the one on the left. This is the broken system. This is how we think it works. If you look at it, Jesus is the foundation, right? The the church pretty much recognizes that. We don't always live like it, but that Jesus is the foundation of the church. And then it goes to staff, right? The next layer up is staff. And so we look at staff and we're like, those are the professionals, the pros. And then on top of the staff, then we place a lot of ministry functions and programs and we pay the staff to run all these programs so that the people can get what they need. And so you've got this little small group of people that are running around like crazy and the entire weight of ministry, the entire weight of the people is sitting on top of a few. Now, just logically, when you look at that, does that make sense? It makes zero sense. But that's how we exist as the church, isn't it? But look on the other side, because this is what we're looking at in Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, that Jesus is the foundation, and then there are leaders in the church. The Bible says apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. We look at those five offices, and we look at those as the ones who do the ministry. But according to Scripture, those people exist so that they equip others to do ministry. And so we have this leadership development. Let me, let me tell you this. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, you're not one of those because you get a paycheck from the church. You can equip just as much by getting your paycheck from the Effingham Board of Education or through a construction company 
as you can through a church. You're not defined by the name on your paycheck. And so we look at this. There's leadership development, and then people are equipped, Ephesians 4, 12a, and then we look at 4, 12b through 16, and then each part of the body does its work. And so this equipping process takes place. It's no longer built on top of Christ with just a few people who are just struggling to try to hold this thing together. It's one of the reasons nine out of 10 people who go into ministry don't finish because the system is broken. And the church is the only organization in history that will continue to do something that does not work over and over and over again without ever having the thought, maybe this isn't right. No business in America is going to do what the church has done and go, well, you know what? This is how we've always done it. By God, this is how we're going to do it. We're not going to be like the world, blah, 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 blah. And I know the intentions of that is good. But at some point, we ought to back up and look at God's word instead of our own mindset of how things ought to be and go, maybe we got something wrong. Because according to Scripture, Jesus said that his church would prevail, that not even the gates of hell would stop the church. So something must be wrong if we're getting our rear ends kicked everywhere we look. And I think this is a big part of it. And you've got to understand, you have a part to play. And it's not an insignificant, meaningless part. Like you, we think sometimes like that some parts aren't as important, but Paul even deals with this. In 1 Corinthians 12, he's like, look, every part is necessary. He even talks here about every ligament, every tendon is necessary. We've got to get away from this on the left and get into this on the right. Where we look at this and there are, leaders who are equipping people who are doing ministry. So what are you equipped for? What are you being equipped for? What are you to be equipped for? Listen, some of you, you'll end up leading small groups. Some of you may start ministry. Some of you will become pastors. Some of you will will end up leading children's ministries, youth ministries, college ministries. You'll end up leading all these different things, all of these different types of ministries. But understand this, that's not all there is to the kingdom. And here's the thing I can tell you, no matter what specific thing God calls you into and what specific gift he begins to show you, the one thing that I can promise you is that at the end of the day, we are all being equipped for the same thing. And that is to make disciples or followers of Jesus. And you don't have to have a title. You don't have to have a position. You don't have to have anything but a love for Jesus, his grace or ability working in you, a love for people and a willingness to walk with them as you walk with Christ. That is all that it requires. You can make disciples anywhere. And I can tell you this, There's nothing more exciting and fulfilling than seeing the light come on, that the eyes of someone are open and they recognize who Christ is. And many times we look at preachers and we're like, oh, wow. We look at the big names. There's nothing better for me than when people in our church go, you know, preacher, I was listening to my favorite pastor the other day on a podcast. I'm like, what am I? You know, I know who I am in Christ, so I push through it. But we kind of idolize the people who are in front of a lot of people and the people who seem to have big ministries and all these other things. But let me tell you this. There's nothing more gratifying, satisfying, energizing, life-giving than sitting across a table from somebody when the eyes are open and all of a sudden it clicks and they go, There's nothing better than that. And that is what we're all called to. And not just to see them saved, but to walk with them in Christ. How are you 
equip them. We're equipped to make disciples. How are you equipped? You are equipped in community. It's that simple. You are equipped in community. We have to understand that it is within this amazing, diverse, multicultural, new community of believers that God has created, that he calls the church. It is within that community that we are raised up, grown up, become mature, and equipped to decide, make disciples and disciple people. You need to understand this, that when we look at that slide on the left, the reason, one of the reasons it doesn't work is because in that model, staff, they're forced to try to take care of all of these people. So the only thing we can do is create programs to take care of people. But here's the thing we have to understand. Programs don't disciple people. People disciple people. He says in verse four, he says, there's one body and one spirit. And this is the key to equipping, that when you come to faith, you become part of one body. Because you no longer belong to you. You belong to Christ and we. You belong to Christ and us. And not only you belong to one body, but you belong and have been filled with one spirit. This is what he tells us. There's one body. There's one spirit. You and I aren't saved to live independently. We're saved to live dependently on Christ and live in relationship with each other. And this is what I want to encourage you with. This is what I'm going to leave you with this morning. You have a part to play. It's not me, it's we. You have a part to play. It's not greater effort. It's amazing grace, his ability in you that gives you the ability to do the part in the body that you are called to do. Listen, it's not about us and them, it's us. You have a part to play that God has enabled you to do through his grace and through his power. And if we wanna see the church become the church that it is created to be, it's when we, when us, step into God's grace that's been apportioned to us and we fulfill the purposes he's called us to. So Father, I thank you this morning. God, for your grace, for your ability in us, open our eyes to see, Lord, that we have a greater part to play. We have a greater part in this, Lord. We have a part in it. And what a privilege to be a part of your church, this unique community. Would you fill our hearts, God, with courage, with faith, God, do for us what we can't do for ourselves. Do in us what we can't do for ourselves. Do through us, God, what we cannot do for ourselves. Do it, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name.